the session for China in the Middle East, the new world power on the scene in the great game of international relations. We decided based on our analysis and based on the experiences uh, of His Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, Viorel Istikaya Budura that uh, he is the most appropriate uh, to chair this panel based on his broadly experience on that region, Asian uh, region. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ambassador Viorelisti uh, Chaya, you have the floor. Thank you, Flavius, for the generous introduction. It's an honor to chair this important panel. Uh, since China was mentioned so many times by the previous speakers, I think logically, uh, now it deserves to be dedicated a special session. It's a challenge in terms of managing the time. And as everything is accelerating, as general trends in the world will have also to accelerate, I will kindly ask the distinguished speakers to try to keep the time to be mindful of the limited economy we may allow to everyone. I will invite, let me check if um, uh, Professor Erzebet Roja uh, yes, is available. Are yes, you connected, I am here. Professor? Uh, yes, bravo. I Let am me here. introduce you briefly. Thank uh, you. you are Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of the World Economics uh, Center for Economic and Regional Studies with Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest. Professor, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, for some reason, I cannot start my video. I don't know why. Maybe the organizer can help me with that. But anyhow, I would I would like to speak about uh, China as uh, as uh, the actor. Uh, I am sorry, I couldn't listen to all the previous speakers. I had classes at the university, but. I would like to speak on China in the Middle East. And uh, the title of my presentation would be, oh, sorry, yes, I will try to start my video. No, it fails. I'm sorry, I cannot switch on. I don't know. So I would rather just go on. Uh, it says that we have to start the video. Andres? We will try to do it, but in the meanwhile, I am going to speak. So, um, it, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Over the Periphery of the Periphery, uh, which is... Uh, uh, which is uh, trying to look at how China perceives the region. On the one hand, um, I claim that China is a newcomer to the region. On the other hand, I would like to claim that China's perception of the region, it, we cannot start the video. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry for this inconvenience. So on the one hand, I would like to claim that China is not alone in the MENA region. And I think that we already heard our uh, Russian uh, professor colleague through FCF saying that as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I would like to claim that although the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa is a penetrated region, meaning that external actors have been present in the proceedings of the region, in the developments of the region, and they were behaving or they are behaving at sometimes as if they were parts of the region as well. This has a historic uh, dimension, obviously. It started with the European colonization and the mandate system. Some speakers have already referred to that. It goes through the Cold War as well, the US-Soviet Union competition in the region. And then in the Helsinki process in 1975, even the Europeans appear when in the final declaration, they have a separate subchapter addressing the Mediterranean and the concept of the Mediterranean as a geographical, regional, political unit appears for the first time. Now in the post-Cold War period, as it was said before, uh, a very strange situation evolves. On the one hand, at first the United States has a unipolar moment, but that's a very short, it is really a moment. And then now, we have the narrative coming from already the third president, if I'm not mistaken, the narrative of withdrawal, 
By the way, a very good piece was written on that by an American colleague, Dalia Dasseke, just two days ago. Uh, it is a narrative, and although there is talk about withdrawal, in fact, as it has also been pointed out here, um, it is far from the reality, and the region does not let the US to go away. However, as uh, Professor Truevtsev also said, the region is not a priority for the external actors, not for the United States, not for Russia, and then maybe not even for China, although that may be changing. And the European Union is practically the only actor which has several reasons to be included, to be involved in the region. Uh, Russia is back after the Cold War, uh, after the end of the Cold War, with the arms trade and civilian nuclear energy. And as uh, our Iranian colleagues and our Syrian colleague was referring to it, uh, practically we could say with low cost participation opportunities in different conflicts, meaning Syria and Libya. And then China arrives with a new, in a new aspect uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if we, if we have a look at, uh, if we go further into the regional dimension, as it was also referred to here, China is not alone on the road from Asia to Europe or between Asia and Europe. There are other actors. Uh, I remember that I heard it in, uh, in, in Tehran uh, already 20 years ago. Who would believe it? It was so long ago that uh, the Iranian foreign minister at the time was speaking about the Iranian concept of Asia as a carriage having four wheels. And uh, Professor Trevtsev also mentioned the four wheels, Russia, China, India, and obviously in the Iranian perception, it was Iran, which was the fourth wheel. However, we could, we could claim that West Asia in itself is a, is a microcosmos with several different actors, Turkey, Iran, Saudi, or, or the Arab countries, um, the GCC, and so on. However, it, is, uh, it means that when China wants to come towards the region, into the region, and through the region, it is not alone. There are other powers who are competing with it, which have overlapping neighborhoods, uh, for example, Russia from the north to the south, President Putin being practically one of the very few politicians who can come into contact with anyone in the region. Then there is India, as was mentioned. We usually forget about India. However, it was also mentioned by one of the morning speakers that India is also there and increasingly there. Uh, coming into the region and trying to get through the region to Central Asia and Afghanistan, and Iran is playing a huge role. And then, of course, China, who has to cut through all these territories, all these overlapping neighborhoods, and all these big uh, uh, global actors have different strategic depths in this region. Interestingly, the, uh, the target or, or, the, or the actor against whom they are phrasing uh, their strategic depth is usually not each other, but usually the United States. And then when we come to the, uh, to the other fact that uh, China is a relative newcomer to the MENA region, here again, we, we have to uh, take a look uh, at the process of how it has come into being. Now, first, we could refer to, of course, to ancient cultures, connections, and the land connection, yet only sporadic relations could be detected. So consequently, on the whole, we could claim that relations are relatively new between China and the MENA region. And basically, we can start this uh, period from the Declaration of the People's Republic of China in 1949. And when we look at the development of China's, Chinese relations towards the MENA region, we can find that the, the development goes practically hand in hand with the development uh, that are taking place within China. So starting from Mao Zedong and Chu Enlai, the socialist, the non-aligned perception, the looking for, for contacts in this uh, ideologically based uh, sphere. 
then over to Deng Xiaoping with the economic opening. Then comes a new phase of, of relation building within the, towards the MENA region. Then Xi Jinping, who brings in a more assertive Chinese foreign and security policy. No wonder that it is under C that the Belt and Road Initiative is coming forward. Yet, while this is happening, we also have to bear in mind that all this happens through and uh, in the framework of the traditional worldview of China, the concentric circles. Of course, these concentric circles have expanded and they have taken on different uh, dimensions uh, all through the years and decades that China is contacting the other parts of the world. However, we could still claim that the MENA region is still the Western periphery of the Western periphery. Now the Belt and Road, the Belt and Road is a new development and in the longer run, it has started to change things, but in the longer run, most probably it will bring along even bigger changes. But in order to do that, we have to also look at the strategic shifts. I already mentioned, and President Obama was already mentioned, with the US pivot to Asia. I could also add to that uh, several European countries were speaking about Eastern opening. My country, Hungary, also has an Eastern opening, at least I think it was officially launched in the year 2010. But I also remember that uh, an Iranian friend of mine has written a book about the Iranian Eastern opening already in the early 2000s. So while the Western part, and now West, I mean that the countries to the West from China all look to China and East Asia and Asia as such and turning towards Asia. In the meanwhile, a Chinese uh, professor, Wang Yixi, wrote his paper on marching west. And this was the basic underlying, should I say, strategy. It's a very short paper, a couple of pages. But uh, Professor Yixi said that, OK, then this is, the, this is the way when everyone comes towards us, then we have to go west and look for the opportunities. And then this had a very strong impact on the, on the reformulation of the Silk Road, of the new Silk Road. Now, China is obviously a responsible superpower, a responsible global power. Uh, it has, uh, as one of the main aims, uh, to keep the US as far from Asia and East Asia as possible. By the way, in that, it, has, it is in agreement with the other great Asian powers, Russia and India, although India has specific relations to the US at the moment. The other thing is that uh, when China looks as the responsible global power, when it looks at itself as the responsible global power, many people ask, especially in the recent years, that, OK, China is coming uh, with economy and the Belt and Road is developing. What if China takes over the Middle East, the MENA region from the US? However, I would like to claim, and maybe my Chinese friends will correct me on that, but to me, it seems that at the moment, at least, China is absolutely satisfied with the US as the security provider in the region. China does not want to be involved in the conflicts of the region, and uh, it rather likes to have a balanced relationship to all conflicting parties, if possible, and it would like to uh, maintain this kind of relationships. And on the other hand, it serves Chinese interests very well if the US is tied down in these conflicts and being a security provider in the region. Of course, the question is how long uh, this can be maintained, but at the moment, this seems to be uh, one of the main uh, issues for China in the region. And another very important aspect of Chinese relations to, uh, to the MENA region is that China still does not perceive the MENA region as one unit. China has bilateral relations instead. Although there has started some kind of uh, Chinese-Arab understanding, meaning there is the China-Arab paper, there is the China-Arab cooperation forum, forum, but still China prefers bilateral relations. And we also have to add 
that China has bilateral relations to Turkey, separately to Iran, separately to Israel. So what China has developed towards in the Middle East and towards the countries of the Middle East should rather be said as a hierarchical set of partnerships. And the Belt and Road Initiative serves as a very good, uh, for, a very good format for that. Sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, Professor Roja, would you be prepared to conclude as soon as possible? In two minutes? Yes, please, go ahead. So, okay, so within this hierarchical set of partnerships, uh, bilateral partnerships, China has comprehensive strategic partnerships. These are the highest grade in the MENA region with only five countries. Algeria, going back to old times, to the non-aligned times. Egypt, again to the non-aligned times. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran. Then there are the a lesser level of strategic partnerships. With Israel, it has a one case partnership, the comprehensive innovative partnership, plus there are the potential partnerships. And then just uh, one more. Um, so what could be the balance, and I would finish with that. What could be the balance of the Belt and Road if we look at the programs and projects now in the MENA region? It could be positive and it could be negative and with a lot of question marks. Positive, usually, where labor force is rare or limited, uh, because in the Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese capital, Chinese loan, Chinese material, Chinese labor. So the acceptance can be ambivalent, but where there is no labor force, where labor force is rare, where it should be imported, like in the Persian Gulf countries, there the balance is positive. Uh, where is negative? Well, uh, in cases where unemployment is very high, where local people cannot be employed because Chinese labor is brought in, where there are different problematic issues over different projects. So we will have to wait and see how the Belt and Road will evolve, what impact China will be able to make on the and if China will have enough soft power to support that. And here in soft power, I also include the health silk road and the, and the vaccine diplomacy. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the well-documented, but still very balanced views, which completed the image in analysis, uh, analyzing the image and presence of China in the Middle East. I would check if the next distinguished speaker, Dr. Khalil Shirgolami, is there and can connect with us and make his intervention. Dr. Khalil Shirgolami. Yes, I see you, good doctor. Yeah, good he's a, good he's a senior expert. Thank you for joining us for the, from the IPIS, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, doctor, you'll have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Bodura. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you in this panel. Uh, I'd like to challenge uh, the notion in the introduction note of this panel uh, that China is on the scene of great game of international relations in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf and to verify if this perception is realistic or not. Uh, well, uh, in my view, to be part of the great game politics uh, in a certain region requires some elements and preconditions, uh, namely uh, political will and determination, multidimensional engagement and entanglement, <coughs> a strategic allies, and a strategic and geopolitical uh, insight, I would say. And I doubt uh, about all four factors when we talk about China's engagement in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. First, uh, as for political determination, I'm not sure uh, about such a determination and will in the side of China. As we see, uh, China still has a limited appetite for challenging the US-led uh, security architecture in the Middle East, or playing a significant role in the regional politics. Even as Professor Roger just mentioned, maybe China's enjoying the security architecture led by the United States in the region. 
Uh, China's narrative uh, is that its involvement uh, in the region does not advance its, uh, its uh, geopolitical goals and pursues a narrative of neutral engagement, neutral engagement with all countries in the region, uh, very far from strategic and geopolitical calculations. This is the challenge of political will. I call it uh, the absence of political will with China. Second, uh, in terms of a scope of entanglement, uh, China's engagement in the region is purely business oriented. As you know, China has other fronts when we talk about security and uh, geopolitics as priority. And none of these fronts and priorities are located in the Middle East or the Persian Gulf for the China. Uh, we can say uh, the Middle East is a secondary region in China's foreign policy. Uh, meanwhile, China's growing economic presence is likely to pull it uh, maybe into wider entanglement with the region in ways that uh, could significantly affect other powers' interests. Beijing uh, will likely be forced to struggle to maintain its neutral narrative as it is and as Chinese interests in the region are growing by time. Furthermore, uh, while the Middle East is peripheral in China's foreign and security policy, with the possible US effort in future uh, to disrupt the China interest in the region, including a uh, free flow of energy, this region will be upgraded into critical national interest for China. The third element, uh, having strategic partners and allies. I guess uh, China has uh, no real strategic ally in the region. Iran could be that ally, but uh, China is not going to antagonize the United States on an Iran issue. So to challenge US dominance in the Middle East, uh, Belt and Road Initiative can create an economic system outside of Washington control for China. Uh, but uh, uh, to proceed, uh, having reliable strategic partners, even for this initiative, having a strategic and reliable partners for China are must. Huh? Okay. From one hand, uh, China is not willing for any deeper political. Uh, commitment and engagement with regional countries. And from other hand, uh, most of the countries in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf are uh, dependent on the America. And even most of them act as a satellite of Washington in the region. And it's quite interesting that some of them, including Saudi Arabia, try to try to use China as a bargaining chip in their interactions with America. Uh, decision makers in Arab countries, as we see, uh, believe that uh, uh, China has not the military and logistical capabilities and political will to provide uh, a credible alternative to US security umbrella in the region. And uh, in the circumstance of disruption of uh, China's interest in the region, if we imagine such a situation, I think Iran is the only country to rely on for China. Other countries, military and uh, security ties with the United States would limit them significantly to work with China in that regard. The fourth element, uh, a strategic insight. Uh, as we know, uh, China has focused on building economic exchanges with region and always avoided taking sides in regional conflicts, as was mentioned by our colleague. Uh, the special characteristic of China's approach for stability in the region is based on the notion of uh, economic efficiency and economic development. 
if China is willing to play power politics game, the looming great power, this will have some requirements and first of all, to have a strategic insight. This is quite important, I guess. And China must adopt a more assertive policy when it comes to principal views and position in strategic issues in the Middle East. Well, all together and considering all these uh, four factors, I'm not very confident that uh, China is willing to be uh, part of a great power games in the region, in the Middle East. At least we don't see any sign for further entanglement of China in the region. And this not, uh, and of course, I do not mean, and uh, this, does, this does not mean that I ignore the Chinese efforts to compete in the region with other powers. Mm, meanwhile, we expect that great power competition between America and China uh, is likely to intensify in the coming years. It is expected and no doubt the Middle East could be an important competition scene for them. Uh, for me, uh, when I talk about China's presence in the region, what's important is that unlike the United States, the China's approach toward the region is not based uh, on the Cold War mentality of uh, zero-sum game and hegemonic dominance. So maybe China can play as a balancer and game changer in the region if determined to do so. And I believe still China is not determined to do. Well, uh, to conclude, uh, Graham Allison in his book uh, in 2017 asked, can America and China escape to use it in this trap? I want to add, if the world, including the Middle East, can escape the implications of possible US-China confrontation in the Middle East in future, if there is any. And in any case, uh, the potential US-China rivalry or confrontation in the Middle East shall not disturb the peace and stability in this difficult region and generate more turbulence there. And for this, I believe that uh, multi-centric distribution of power and empowering regional states themselves based on cooperative peace, based on the notion of cooperative peace could be the solution. Thank you so much. I end here. Thank you for keeping up with the time, respecting so much that request. And also thank you for offering us a good deal of food for thought. Thank you so much. I'll go next to uh, Dr. Li Zixin from China. Uh, are you there, Dr. Li? Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry for my colleague because he has some technical problems. So I'll, I will speak for him, I give his okay. <laughs> script to me. Yao, okay. Yao Xiansheng, we, we welcome yes, you yes. to the place, Mr. Li. Yes. Uh, you Yao can speak very fluent Chinese. Yes. I see. You are from okay. the same institute, yeah? Yeah. China Institute of International Studies. Yes, yes. Affiliated and, with the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh -huh. Affiliated yes. with the Ministry Ch of Foreign Affairs. Yes, Chinese MOFA. Okay, yes. Then, uh, okay. please go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, I think China is a hot topic right now. Uh, before I, 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 read, I read my colleague's uh, script, I will say some. Um, my own opinions about China's role in the Middle East. Uh, first, I think China did not want to get into a strategic competition uh, to, to US, to America. I think it's a priority for, from China's point of view. Uh, and second, I think China want to get in the Middle East, but did not want to be trapped in the Middle East or in Afghanistan. And the uh, third one, I think, uh, China will stick to its non-intervene principle and uh, don't want to get into the domestic politics in the Middle East states. And of course, uh, some people send a message to me about uh, the Afghanistan issue. 
I think for, uh, for Afghanistan issue, uh, China's uh, concerns, uh, first one is the stability in our West land, especially the Xinjiang province. Uh, I have I come to Xinjiang for several times. I, I see it from my own eyes that it changed from safe to dangerous and then to safe. I know how Afghan Afghanistan's behaviors in, in Florence, Xinjiang's uh, safe in this decade. And uh, the this, this second is uh, China is not the only country to have connections with uh, Afghanistan Taliban in these months. I think many countries will uh, have uh, will contact with, with, with Taliban and have some, uh, uh, some relations with him. And I think uh, China did not own, did not assist Taliban. China also want to persuade Taliban to be uh, a, a moderate a, body, a moderate power in Afghanistan. I think uh, China uh, has the responsibility or, or it is also uh, in China's interest to, to persuade Taliban to be a moderate one. And uh, uh, the, 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 the last one in my opinion is that I think China is a big, big country now, but I think China is not strong enough and smart enough uh, to, to know how to use its power or exert its, its power. Uh, Chinese, China is also trying to learn how to uh, use its power because uh, I know many uh, criticizes or complaints uh, about China's, uh, uh, China's diplomacy uh, these years. Uh, yes, China did something wrong, but uh, I, uh, we should know that China has has become a big power not for so many years. China is still not so mature enough, and we uh, still try to to learn to be a responsible uh, power in this world. And uh, uh, we hope to be more mature. We we hope to be more smart. So I think the uh, the world the region should give us time to uh, to 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 uh, to exercise to to learn. So this is my opinions, uh, and and then I will uh, re uh, take a replace of my uh, my colleague Li Zixin to say something about his opinions about uh, the China-U.S. relations in the Middle East. Uh, okay, uh, he think that in recent years, under the combined influence of the following three factors: uh, first, uh, the construction of U of U.S. MENA strategy; second. China's expanding influence in the Middle East, and the third, tensions become uh, China and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. concerns uh, towards China are mainly in three areas. Uh, first, China's high-tech influence. Second, uh, China's large-scale infrastructure development. And third, China's arms sales in the, in, in the Middle East. Uh, in the high-tech sector, the U.S. Uh, fears that China will eventually promote uh, Chinese standards around the world, which will compete with existing Western standards and even replace the United States someday. Uh, based on the imagined Chinese threat, the US states began to complain about uh, China's co cooperation with the regional uh, countries. However, in the face of US uh, provocations, China has neither confronted nor undermined U.S. MENA policy, nor has it asked regional countries to choose a side between China and the U.S. In recent years, uh, security cooperation between Israel, Arab states, and the United States has increased, and uh, Iran, Turkey, and Russia have coordinated with each other in the closer way. China uh, maintained good relations with uh, parties in both camps with closer economic ties to the United States and uh, stronger political ties to Russia. And uh, just to take a uh, uh, cooperation between China and I Iran as an example, Iran is the biggest enemy of US in the region, but uh, China has not increased its cooperation rapidly with Iran due to the deterioration of U.S.-China relations, but has steadily uh, promoted bilateral cooperation uh, within the existing framework. Uh, according to the uh, Chinese customers, China imported 6 billion U.S. dollars of crude oil from Iran in, 
in 2019 and only 1.3 billion in 2020. And China did a sign of 25 year cooperation plan with Iran, but it is a long term cooperation and we are only uh, considering the social economic needs of both China and Iran, not for uh, constraining the US. Uh, in fact, China can maintain good relations with all parties in this region, uh, not because uh, how well China has done itself, but because, because of the construct of the Western countries. Uh, the United States, for example, have moved, uh, uh, has have, have, have become to use more sanctions in MENA over the past 30 years, reflecting uh, a positive, friendly, and peaceful image of China. Uh, the U.S. also use economic, scientific, and uh, technical influence as a hard power and uh, frequently sanctions regional countries, including uh, even its ally, Turkey. Uh, China use economic, scientific, and uh, technical influence as a soft power has, and has never used uh, economic sanctions in this region. Uh, in the last decade, uh, while China and the regional countries have collaborated more and more closely in the international politics, global attention has focused mainly on China's uh, economic relation with MENA. The rapid economic development of China and the regional countries is a fact, uh, but, uh, uh, but it is also some imagination or exaggeration and misinformation uh, of international public opinion. Uh, currently, uh, lots of foreign scholars and uh, media, as well as uh, some Chinese scholars, I imagine uh, China's MENA policy is a lake of separation uh, between the government and business, uh, with business being the, the instrument of state strategy, and the party and the government uh, being a backstage of business. Uh, such idea under, underestimate the level of professionalism in China state governance, and also seriously underestimates the influence and the biting force of China diplomatic principles on uh, realistic policies. Uh, the philosophy of China believes in China's own strengths and uh, international political realities. All of those factors uh, do not allow China's future media policy to be a re- uh, production of U.S. historical policy. China hopes the stability of MENA, but is now trying to shape the regional order. Uh, actually, no country can do it. Uh, China does not see the MENA as an arena for major powers, but rather calls on other powers to stop interfering in MENA internal affairs. China does not advocate the so-called rule-based international order uh, because the rules uh, should not be defined by a, a hegemonic state or group of states. And China advocates the maintenance of an international order uh, based on international law and reject uh, the foreign intervention. The philosophy above will be reflected in China's uh, future MENA policy. Uh, this is my friend point uh, presentation and don't re re represent my own opinions. So uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Yao Jinxiang. Thank you for conveying to us the thoughts and remarks of your colleague and adding some of your uh, ideas. Thank you so much. It was very substantial and helped us to understand better some of the positions and policies of People's Republic of China. Thank you for your intervention. Um, I see you connected, Pro uh, Professor Leoni. Uh, would you mind to, to wait for two other, uh, two more interventions and speak towards the end of the session? Is that okay with you? Uh, it's, no, it's no, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, no problem. Um, my intervention will be probably short, a bit shorter than others. So that's fine if it's at the end. So if we need to catch uh, well, up Well, I think time. in 10 minutes, uh, a quarter of an hour, you, you'll be next. But for a while, please allow me to give the floor to... Um, uh, Dr. Mogelnitsky, Robert Mogelnitsky from USA, senior resident scholar. I've seen you got connected, uh, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Mogelnitsky, it's a senior research, uh, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Can you hear me, Doctor? Yes, I can. I hope. Can everyone? Are you hear ready me? to to present your intervention? 
Yes. We'll be Can happy you to listen to. Please go ahead. Yes. I do. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's nice to hear my name with the uh, Polish uh, pronunciation. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Flavius and, and others uh, here who organized this event. Very glad to be with you all this morning. And also thank you to the previous panelists made some excellent points. I hope to build upon those uh, points and expand our discussion in, in new directions. So as, as you said in, in your introduction, I, I look at China's role in the Middle East as part of a broader political economy portfolio that I manage at the Institute. But I've also been teaching a class this semester on China Middle East relations at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. I have my last uh, class of the semester later today, actually. So I've had some time to think about this broad topic, um, both in a policy sense uh, at the Institute uh, here in Washington and in an academic sense with you know, master students and looking at the broader, um, broader uh, spectrum of relations. And I think um, what I wanted to try to do today here in my talk is compare how the policy community thinks about China's role in the region and then look at what the data and economic, uh, I'm sorry, the data and academic research actually tells us. And I would say that these two um, stories aren't always speaking the same language. So what, I, what I'll put forth today is that uh, China's role in the Middle East and North Africa is um, in many cases exaggerated and in many other cases understated. And the reality really um, reflects more of a middle ground of analysis that is more nuanced, but um, necessarily less sensational and in some cases a little bit uh, maybe dismissive. Uh, and that's probably not what you're going to get in your news and media headlines. So let me just um, kick things off by, uh, by mentioning three areas wherein I think the Chinese presence in uh, the region is exaggerated. Um, this might be a little bit controversial, but I'll say first and foremost, the BRI. I mean, let's be honest, the Belt and Road Initiative largely goes, if you look at maps, the best maps that we have, above and below the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, China or Chinese officials say that the BRI is open to all nations, but its primary partners uh, and the focus is on China's immediate neighborhood. And this gets to what some of the previous speakers um, mentioned in terms of priorities, uh, the MENA, you know, China's priorities for the MENA region. Of course, there are certain parts of the BRI. The Suez Canal is a really is, is, is quite an important node in the BRI. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the economic corridor with Pakistan, these are important areas um, or pieces of the BRI that do cross through uh, and um, you know, through and across the Middle East and North Africa. But by and large, we don't see a major BR BRI presence on the ground. I'd really uh, challenge anyone to show me evidence of that. Um, Governments in the region try very, very hard to brand economic collaboration as uh, BRI initiatives and um, have various reasons to do so. But in many cases, these, uh, this branding and marketing and these pledges of $10 billion for industrial cities in Oman um, do not actually materialize. And we saw that uh, we are seeing that play out in places like Dukham. Um, now, I think the digital Silk Road and some of the maritime uh, corridors, there's maybe a little bit more to dig into there. So I'm not saying that the BRI and all of its various dimensions are, are insignificant, but I think this is an area where I would say, especially here in Washington, we see a bit of exaggeration and it's important to separate out the different dimensions of the BRI and then how it applies to different parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Number two is uh, has to do with China's interests in Iran as an economic partner, I would say hugely exaggerated. Um, first, China has a hierarchy to its strategic partnerships. So just because they're all called strategic partnerships does not mean that they are all, are all equally important. Um, I would argue that those strategic partnerships and comprehensive strategic partnerships with Gulf Arab states are much, much more important than uh, the one partnership with Iran. Um, the figure of $400 billion investment of investments that we heard associated with this 25-year strategic uh, partnership, I think has no basis in historical data. 
over the last several years, confirmed Chinese investments from rep reputable trackers have suggested that Chinese investments across the entire Middle East and North Africa region have totaled somewhere between 200 and $300 billion. So there's absolutely no way that $400 billion investment figure um, would be reached. I think a lot of people have been critical of the claims made uh, around uh, this kind of China-Iran yeah. economic cooperation. Um, there's something there, but it's certainly not as large of a balloon as, um, um, as, as it has been made out to be in, in much of the media, in, especially in, in a lot of Western media. Uh, third, I would say that, uh, and some of the previous panelists mentioned this, that China wants to play the role of a security uh, guarantor in the Middle East. I don't think there's much evidence of this. Uh, China's done a much better job um, seeking areas wherein it has a comparative advantage uh, rather than seeking to directly compete in spaces long dominated or held by uh, US or other, other powers. Of course, energy security is an important consideration for, um, for, for, for China, but it seems like regional powers at the moment, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, are talking more, um, are taking more responsibility on a regional level for holding dialogues and creating, trying to create security frameworks, trying to reduce tensions um, and conflicts in the region. And I think the Chinese are much more likely to support these forms of initiatives rather than seek to replace the US as um, a security uh, guarantor. So that's where I think some of, some of the areas where we see an exaggeration of China's presence in the MENA region. What about in the other direction where China's presence is understated? Well, first, uh, there are a lot of people here in Washington who try to say that China is not, or make the argument that China is not as important of an economic actor as, as we think, and they cite low investment levels, unfulfilled investment uh, pledges, and low levels of job creation in the region. And the argument follows then that US and European partnerships are going to be much more influential over the long run. But if we think in terms of especially the Gulf Arab region, uh, those oil and gas producing states, this view or the argument that I laid out doesn't really give us the full picture because we can't just stop our analysis with the recognition that China um, you know, purchases, is, purchases a, a lot of hydrocarbon commodities and that's it. They're not necessarily great investment partners. Uh, why? Because um, we, we have to remember these governments are still largely reliant on the proceeds from oil and gas revenues. Uh, they fund usually more than 70% of public sector uh, budgets. And we know in this region that the public sector is the main driver of economic activity. It employs most of the citizens, um, provides subsidies for the country, provides the incentives and all of the good kind of exemptions that attract private sector business. So without those proceeds from the oil and gas sector, the majority of, so without government proceeds, the majority of which come from the oil and gas sector, of which China is the most important driver of, uh, of hydrocarbon commodities, um, we don't have this whole system, the economic system, uh, working it, the way that we we understand it to work. So I would say, I wrote a piece for the, about this in the World Politics Review. But in short, that China's economic influence is um, much deeper in an indirect sense. So you can't just look at the headline figures. You have to look deeply at the indirect economic influence that China has um, in in this region. Uh, two, and the briefly, I'll just end after two very, very other brief, brief points. Um, I, I believe the key sectors and industries earmarked for development across the region, and I do focus mostly on the GCC region, so apologies, it's time constraints would prevent me from looking at the broader region anyways, but um, the areas that are earmarked as high priority for economic diversification and kind of future proofing these uh, economies are areas that China has a, a really a, a comparative advantage in, or at least in significant expertise um, to, uh, to leverage. I'm speaking here about renewables, um, uh, technology services, and you know, tourism and luxury tourism. All of these, uh, these areas, just to name a few, um, are high priority areas, uh, especially in the Gulf, but across the broader region. And I think it, you know, the continued development of these sectors and industries will permit Chinese firms and consumers to play a large role in the region's economy for years to come. Finally, 
the I mentioned the digital Silk Road. I think that's probably a more useful way than the BRI of thinking about kind of longer term Chinese engagement in the region beyond the Suez Canal and some of the economic corridors. But the proliferation of Chinese technologies from telecommunications to media apps are setting the foundation for the region's youth bulge. As we know, a large chunk of the region are you know, um, under the age of 25. Um, I don't have the, I forget the figures off the top of my head, but we're talking about young consumers who are eager to, uh, to, uh, to consume technology and I think uh, if you look at what's going on with 5G, with Wi-Fi, with Chinese uh, devices, robotics, artificial intelligence, telemedicine, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You're talking about young consumers who potentially can be, uh, will become longtime uh, users of Chinese technology um, for, uh, for decades. So these are some of the areas which I see that these are understated areas, but have the potential to actually increase engagement over the long run. Um, I hope that was helpful uh, addition to the conversation and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Mogilnitsky, for your substantial review of a few relevant aspects of the Chinese involvement in the Middle East. I'll go now to uh, Dr. Shiraki. Let me check if he's connected to us. Uh, Dr. Garinek Keshia Shayan. Uh, Shiraki, yes, head of Department uh... of Political Science. Yeah. Uh, hello, um, everybody. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, do you have my uh, sound? We have your sound. We don't have your image. Would you be so kind to yes, check if there is a video connection? My, uh, no, I have problem with my screen. I excuse me. I see. Uh, yes. Uh, you are the the second lady we are missing uh, in seeing today. You see, our beauty context uh, is missing <laughs> two performing ladies. Sorry for that. But we are ready to listen to you, Dr. Siraki. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, US-China uh, competition in North Africa. Um, China's One Belt, One Road uh, initiative introduced by President um, Xi Jinping during his visits to Central uh, and um, Central and Southeast Asia in late uh, 2013 has rapidly gained momentum with its uh, potential impact on trade and um, investment in Africa uh, increasingly apparent. Africa has long uh, been an important market for China with investment from Chinese uh, com um, companies, both private and uh, state-owned banks, both, uh, uh, both uh, commercial and policy and individuals spanning the entire continent. Moreover, the strength uh, and depth of this broad economic and trading relationship continues to grow. Uh, the abundance of natural resources in Af uh, Africa makes the continent both an uh, excellent trading uh, partner and an attractive uh, investment dis uh, distinction for energy hungry China with its population of 1.3 billion and um, consequent need for raw mater uh, materials and uh, ex um, excess of uh, infrastructure development uh, capabilities. Uh, one uh, Belt, One Road uh, in initiative is a transform uh, transformational development strategy, uh, strategy and framework uh, promoted by the highest levels of the Chinese government. It uh, focuses on connectivity um, and uh, cooperation among countries along two uh, main routes, uh, the land-based Silk Road Economic Belt and the ocean going maritime Silk Road, which run uh, through the 
continent, uh, continents of Asia, Europe, and Africa. Uh, importantly, um, one uh, Belt One Road and particularly the Maritime Silk Road uh, touches on a number of African countries in East and South, uh, Southeastern Africa, such as Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, South Africa, North Africa, Sudan, uh, Egypt, Morocco, and Algeria, and some countries such as the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the broad strategy for, uh, for the initiative is uh, set out it in its framework document, visions and uh, actions on jointly building Silk Road economic belt and uh, 21st century maritime Silk Road, issued in March um, 2015 by Chinese National Development and Reform Commission, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Commerce. It uh, states that One Belt One Road initiative aims to promote the connectivity of Asian, European, and African countries and their adjustments uh, establish and strengthen uh, part um, part um, partnership among the countries along the Belt and Road, set up all the dimensional military and uh, composite connectivity uh, networks and realize uh, diversified, um, independent, balanced, and uh, sustainable development in these countries. Uh, key sectors of uh, One Belt, One Road include energy and power, infrastructure projects, public utilities, uh, construction, transport, and logistics, technology, media, uh, telecoms, and information technology, uh, financial markets. Uh, key focuses for um, this uh, pro uh, program, um, One Belt, One Road uh, underlines Chinese push to, to take a larger role in global affairs and its need to export capacity in industrial affairs where there is uh, overproduction such as steel manufacturing and uh, infrastructure construction. At uh, its core, uh, One Belt One Road uh, demonstrates a high level political commitment in China to work with participating countries to uh, facilitate an uh, increase in inter uh, interconnection and trade and investment flows. Um, OBOR is focused on uh, reducing barriers to trade, both uh, material such as uh, in uh, uh, adipiate port, uh, rail, or and road uh, infrastructure and less tangible, uh, such as um, enhancing trade uh, liberalization and easing customs and uh, coercion process. Um, More than two minutes. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. But um, Every these points, uh, total Chinese economic, political, and military activities in Africa uh, builds US Chinese competition in North Africa, Chinese uh, full pr presence on the African uh, continent has caused uh, concern in the United States, and this has become a serious uh, re rivalry between the two uh, continents on the uh, uh, countries on the continent. Uh, on the other side of the world, surveys uh, show that uh, Democrats and Republicans have not taken a different approach to Africa and that the uh, African region as a whole 
uh, has never had as significant and strategic aspects for Washington as East Asia or the Middle East. Um, in the past two decades, uh, China, uh, China has, despite the expansion of the US military uh, presence in Africa, there is also the fact that uh, US trade in Africa has uh, declined in recent years and uh, bilateral trade has uh, declined from uh, $100 billion in 2008 to thir uh, $39 billion in uh, 2017. The lack of a realistic American strategy for Africa was a golden opportunity to Beijing and China is now a major uh, player in uh, um, Africa's economy, politics, and security. Uh, and I think, um, yes, yes. Uh, political and military rivalry on the one hand and Chinese effort the employment uh, one belt one road economic plan has turned the African continent, uh, especially the north into a region of serious rivalry between China and the United States. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shiraki, for your contribution. Uh, next, uh, Professor Leoni. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for uh, bearing with us. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, as I see, Professor Zeno Leoni, lecturer in War Studies at Defense Studies Department, Defense Academy uh, in UK, uh, affiliate Low China Institute, King's College in the United Kingdom. Professor, you may have the floor. Thank you very much and thanks for the kind invitation. And it was a pleasure to uh, sit here and listen to uh, the other colleagues. And speaking of which, I think there are, there's quite a lot of agreement uh, between our slightly different views. So I, um, I think I'll keep, it, I'll keep it brief also conscious of the time. And I thought this might have been an opportunity for me to infer just a few points from uh, a chapter that I that I brought, but it hasn't been published yet. It's forthcoming with uh, the Routledge Handbook of China-Mina uh, Relations in 2022, edited by Yahya Zubir. So there's a chapter of mine in there um, looking at US-China um, relations or uh, competition or lack of competition, as we'll see, perhaps, um, in the Middle East. Um, uh, in the Gulf and the broader uh, MENA region. Um, so uh, my takeaway point from, from that chapter, as it has kind of been alluded to somehow already, is that I think that the, at the moment, the US and China, <clears throat> excuse me, have, a, uh, have found, perhaps involuntarily, a sort of modus uh, vivendi in the region, a sort of uh, uh, balance. Um, and this is because I think there seem to be um, uh, sorry, different priorities for the two great powers. And so these interests, um, to an extent, they do not clash. Although, of course, competition remains and I've had the chance to, uh, to talk to some diplomats from the EU in the regions and they were complaining that, that they can feel having their everyday job, a lot of pressure, but I'm talking at a grand strategic level, okay? so. I think there's there's a there's a balance there's a there's an equilibrium, and and due to to different interests different priorities. So on the one hand we have the United States who is uh, increasingly focused on uh, on the Indo-Pacific. I'm sure this has been discussed earlier in in the morning, and which for the time being wants to maintain a um, offshore balancing posture in the MENA region, and this this has lasted since really since uh, Obama and through the Trump administration. So with Obama, we saw, um, we heard Obama saying things like, uh, you know, more people die in a bathtub uh, compared to, rather than because of terrorism. And then we saw Trump in his first trip abroad to uh, Saudi Arabia um, uh, saying, we don't want to, you know, we, are, we want to approach the Middle East with a realist, realist perspective. 
uh, we don't want to come here and give lectures to other countries, our countries, which was probably a reference to uh, the Bush uh, administration, uh, foreign policy in the Middle East. And then again, I mean, there is a lot of, I think there is a lot of strategic continuity with some tactical changes between the different presidents, especially between Obama and Trump in the region. I think with Biden, we're kind of going back to Obama to an extent um, in, in uh, what I mean by this. Um, of course, even with Biden, China, the Indo-Pacific are the priority and great power competitions are the priorities on, on the top of the list, are on the top of the list for, for this administration. But obviously to, for the US to focus on the Indo-Pacific region, it is um, essential that, that in the Middle East, there is at least a degree of stability because that's what I guess, that's the interest of the United States, the ground strategic interest in the MENA region nowadays is stability. It's not anymore about uh, controlling or uh, uh, for for a nation for a national interest from a national interest point of view is more about guaranteeing uh, stability to to the global economy, which is ultimately beneficial to to the United States. And and I guess that that is that explains why on the top of the agenda of Biden in this region in the MENA region there is uh, peace in Yemen, there is reestablishing a sort of uh, perhaps, I don't know to what extent friendly, but a more stable uh, relationship with, this, with Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, perhaps getting um, getting around back on to a, a, a deal, uh, although this will be tricky and it probably won't look like the deal of um, the Obama administration. So these are the priority of the US and this tells us that the US interest in the region has been declining to an extent. And on the other hand, although with a lot of unevenness, although with a lot of rhetoric, as we heard, although with a lot of limits, uh, China's interest in the region are rising. And I'm sure uh, China's policy paper about the Middle East will have been uh, mentioned uh, um, early this morning. Um, China is increasingly committed, invested in the region economically, uh, of course, technologically. Uh, but is uh, very far from being a military actor or a security uh, provider. Perhaps in terms of non-traditional security, yes, but not in terms of traditional security. China doesn't have the, the power projection, the, the logistic to, to engage in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, conflict. Uh, and so this is why somehow, although the US is unhappy with uh, some of the, if you want, economic and technological successes, of China in the region, uh, the, the US is not very keen to, to, to conduct that kind of business, to invest as much as China is doing. And on the other hand, China is unable to provide the kind of military security that the US is providing. So that's what, I'm, what I mean when I'm saying there's a modus vivendi. So there seems to be, they seem to tolerate um, uh, each other. And so the US decline, China rises, uh, of course, at some point, this balance will be disrupted, will be broken, but I don't see that for the foreseeable future. And I think it, this balance might be challenged at some point if China was to uh, begin to think about formal military alliances in the region, which will improve the logis military logistics of China, or if China, when China was to, uh, when China will have a proper sort of Mahanian kind of deep water navy, China is working towards that, but I think it's still very much uh, behind. And in addition, China don't have an interest in doing that, in, in dominating in the region for, for all the reasons that have been uh, mentioned uh, so far. And so, yes, my, uh, I think I've, I'd like to, uh, to, to close my, my speech here. Um, what we see in the Middle East, again, as we heard from one of the colleagues is that there's a transition perhaps to, towards more towards multipolarity as we've seen it in the uh, more in general in the liberal international order, in the world order. Uh, and it's not just about the US and China, there's Turkey, they run uh, Saudi Arabia spending a lot of uh, money on defense lately. Uh, so uh, I wonder whether um, this, this will be perhaps provocative for, from, for, for, for an American audience, but we have seen Trump 
complaining a few years ago about the fact that other powers are not doing enough to guarantee the security of, of the sea lanes that go that travel through the region. I wonder whether at what point we'll start to see, and if you know, if it might be wise uh, for both the US and China to start to think more in terms of cooperation from that point of view, in order to in order to share the burden. Of course, there are pros and cons from both an American and uh, Chinese uh, point of view. But I wonder whether this uh, will happen in, in, in the coming year, um, especially because I think we are in a new Cold War. And in many areas, there is a lot of competition. But at the moment, in this area, this might be one of the few areas where the two great powers might cooperate. And I shall stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leoni. Thank you for sharing with us that appeal for sharing the burden, even in making questions and seeking answers. That's uh, a way of sharing burden.